October evening, just two weeks to the election, probably the most election for a very long time. Have all of you registered to vote? Yes. Has anyone not registered to vote? Because if you haven't, it's too late. Yeah, yesterday. Oh. Can we just get a show of hands? Raise your hand if you are going to vote. That's quite good. Not everyone. Raise your hand if you're not going to vote. Raise your hand if you know what the different parties stand for. I've got five questions for you. If you can answer all five, we pass with flying colours. Number one. In their manifestos, the four front-running parties have pledged to increase NHS funding from 2.5 billion, which is the lowest amount promised, to at least 8 billion a year, the highest amount. Which party is promising the lowest amount in their manifesto? Raise your hands if you think you know the answer to that. Okay, well, which party do you think of this? You think it's Conservative? The answer is Labour. Very confusing. One of the things Labour is attacking Conservatives for is for promising 8 billion when they're only promising 2.5 billion, something the Conservatives have got all this money in their pocket, they're throwing to the NHS because it's a weak point. Number two, which party is promising to raise £1 billion from extra corporation tax on the banking sector? No? The answer is Liberal Democrats. So you all failed so far. <laughs> Next one, number three. Which party will scrap sex education for primary children? Well done, we've got the first correct answer down here. You <laughs> promising to scrap the sex education. Which party, number four, which party promises to scrap Trident and tuition fees? Green Party, correct, the second correct answer. Round of applause, please. Last question. Which party will deliver the biggest programme of investment in roads since the 1970s? It's in the manifesto. Which party is promising the biggest programme of investment in roads since the 1970s? You are? Tories. Tories. Two correct answers here. We've got to start here. Round of applause again. So, nobody got all five questions right, therefore this talk is aimed at you. This is called an idiot's guide to the election, which is either insulting you or me, it's probably going to be me, but it's a guide to what the parties stand for, for simpletons. So I'm not going to be pretend it's impartial or even fair, but hopefully I can explain where the parties have come from and why this election is so weird. It may begin to explain why the too old or three party system seems to be in big trouble. To do that, we need some history. And now I'll talk about what's happening now. So, politics used to be so simple, even idiots understood it. Parliament, including the House of Lords, had real lords in it, the kinds that went hunting on their massive estates and drank gallons of port all day long. Parliament was important because there were, that's where taxes were raised for when the king went to war, which was most of the time. Eventually, Parliament became so, so powerful that in the English Revolution of 1649, one faction of Parliament, led by Thomas Cromwell, cut off <laughs> the king's head and proclaimed a republic. We did this 150 years before the French, on January the 30th. We don't celebrate January the 30th, 1649 anymore. I wonder why. But after about 10 years of being a republic, Parliament decided we needed a king again. That was mainly because everyone wanted their say in government. The army, the levellers, the diggers, even dirt poor people wanted a vote. So Parliament thought decision-making should be left to wealthy gentlemen. They worried about ordinary people wanting a vote. At least with a real king, everyone knew their place. So, we had... The Restoration. The Restoration 
we invited King Charles II, who looked a bit like his father, back, and we pretended we had never been a republic, or cut off his father's head. And two factions in Parliament began to form, one called the Tories, and the other called the Whigs. Now, Tory is an Irish term of abuse. It means Papist outlaw, because some were suspiciously Catholic. Whigs was a, term, a Scottish term of abuse, meaning horse thief. So here are the... Here are the Tories, the Papists, and here are the Whigs, who were more Protestant, which is why I put a P, the Protestant symbol there. The Tories were the ones who were really sorry that they cut off Charles I's head. They stood for God, King and Country, and they still do. But they also represented country gentlemen and keeping the status quo. The Whigs were just a bit sorry they cut off Charles I's head. The Whigs represented merchants and later industrialists. They were more Protestant and nonconformist than the Tories and wanted a bit more progress. They got rid of another Catholic king, James II, and installed a constitutional monarchy. So we can now get rid of the king because the king no longer has any real power. And that's due to the Whigs. A constitutional monarchy is where the kings drink port all day long and just rubber stamp whatever parliament decides. The Whigs were known for their radical ideas, like ending slavery, or stopping children working in mines 14 hours a day. Preposterous, shouted the Tories. But the Whigs wanted to give the vote to a few more people. The Whigs rebranded in the 19th century as Liberals. In 1900, the Labour Party was formed by the unions. I'm going to move the, the Liberals to the centre now and put our left-wing party, the Labour Party, there. They wanted someone to represent the working classes who were mostly ignored by other parties. No one really stood up for the working class because they didn't have the vote. But eventually the working class got the vote because Parliament was taxing them to pay for expensive wars, like the Boer War and the First World War. The Labour Party was a very small party at first, but it grew, and to everyone's surprise, including Labour, it, it won the election after the Second World War. By this time, the Liberals were a small party because people couldn't forgive them for something. The Liberals down here because they don't matter anymore. There's just two parties after the First World War who were important. The Liberals were, couldn't be forgiven for force-feeding suffragettes, uh, something else, people have forgotten what it was, uh, and people concentrated on the new exciting Labour Party who were much more radical. If you remember, the Whigs were used to think that they were radical when they did things like ending slavery. But the Labour Party was properly left-wing, radical, socialist party in the 1940s. For example, they introduced free health care, when Conservatives like Winston Churchill thought we couldn't afford it. We were broke after the Second World War, and here's this party saying we're going to introduce free healthcare. But we managed free healthcare and free education, and from the 1960s, Labour and the Conservatives even paid students to go to university. That gave students more time to sit around listening to Hawkwind and smoking dope. They didn't have to stack shelves in the supermarket. So, if your parents went to university, ask them why they sat around smoking dope all day and didn't work for a living, living like you do. After the war, Labour continued, decided to continue things that have been normal. Things like very high income tax for the wealthiest and controlling what they called the means of production. No one says that anymore, but what it means is the mines, steel, electricity, gas, telecommunications, railways, pretty much half the economy was controlled by the state, as it was in the Second World War. But not shops, not restaurants, or factories making things like toys or bicycles or steak and kidney puddings. They left that to evil capitalists. And they taxed the profits to pay for the free stuff like health and education. Now this was pretty popular especially with your hippie parents, and mostly worked, and it carried on until the 1970s, even under the Conservatives. 
But in the 1970s, things got ugly for a variety of reasons. There were lots of strikes. Oil price prices went sky high. The Vietnam War bankrupt America, and it basically all got really shabby compared to the swinging 60s when everyone had a job and money. And in 1979, a new conservative leader called Mrs Thatcher was elected Prime Minister. And she was very cross about the unions of the state of the country. She was like a stern nanny telling the children to tidy up their messy rooms. And lots of people thought she was great. Mrs Thatcher wanted to privatise everything. She privatised British Airways, British Steel, British Gas, British Telecom, British Leyland, Rolls-Royce, British Petroleum, British Aerospace, Water, Electricity and about 50 other companies. And John Major continued to privatise British Rail. So we went from having the best railway in the 1970s in Europe, apart from the coffee and sandwiches which were genuinely awful, <laughs> to having one of the worst and most expensive in the 1990s. So privatisation isn't always a good thing. And the unions went from being strong and on strike all the time to being really weak and never on strike. So let's be join the union. And even the Labour Party started to move away from the unions. And they got their money from the unions. By the 1990s, the Labour Party was really tired of losing elections. So they elected a young, handsome leader, Tony Blair, and called themselves New Labour. So out went the red flag, and in came the red rose. The red rose is a little bit less scary to people who live in Hatcher and Surrey. So the red, 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 the red flag was dropped. So eventually, it actually got quite hard. Sorry. So New Labour liked a lot of things Mrs Thatcher had done, and did a bit more privatising, a few things the Tories had missed. They also introduced tuition fees, £1,000 initially, and then, despite promising not to, they introduced top-up fees of £3,000. So they weren't left-wing or socialist anymore. They dropped the red flag, uh, uh, and eventually it got hard to tell the difference between Conservatives and Labour. And then Labour had three wars. One in Yugoslavia, one in Afghanistan, and one in Iraq. And the last two went very badly. Despite Tony Blair's promise, there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and this was the reason we went to the war. No WMD. Not even a thimbleful of poison gas. There was probably more dangerous chemicals in your local swimming pool than there were found in Iraq. So many of uh, Labour supporters were angry because of these wars and because Labour wasn't socialist anymore. It didn't nationalise anything. Not even the railways. When even a majority of the population said, please nationalise the railways, they're terrible. Labour was friendly to bankers and rich people and reduced their taxes. It let private companies build bridges and hospitals and then rent them back to the government at extortionate rates. The NHS got loads of brand new hospitals, but it, had to co it would cost the NHS tons of money, so it started to get into serious debt. So with Labour and the Tories now so similar, people got confused. They thought, maybe it's time to give another party a chance. A party that wouldn't go to war, or break their promises, and do things like raise tuition fees. So they voted for... The Liberal Democrats. They were back. Now, if you remember, they used to be Whigs. And they had not formed a government since the First World War. They signed a promise, a written pledge, they made a big deal about it, not to increase by one penny tuition fees. And they even talked about, on the hustings, free education for everyone, which was far more left-wing than Labour. So lots of people voted for them. Well, your students, you know how that went. The fees went from £3,000 a year to £9,000 a year. Thanks, Nick Clay. So after 2010, lots of people said they would never vote Liberal Democrat again. In fact, a lot, said, a lot of people said they would never vote at all again. And a comedian called Russell Brand said voting made you complicit in propping up a rotten political system that was designed around the needs of corporations and elites, not ordinary people on the planet. And despite all this high floating language, that this video was watched by 10 million people, which is even more than EastEnders. And they got people talking about the state of politics. But here we are in 2015, and a lot of pop people probably will vote. So what's the choice? Well, there's Labour, who aren't new Labour, 
That's because people got so cross at Tony Blair for going to war for no reason at all in Iraq. Ed Miliband is nothing like Tony Blair. Ed, uh, Tony Blair was a, was a handsome, smooth-talking man. And then there's the Tories who said at the last election that they were really nice people. who wouldn't make any cuts to the NHS, and they were so green they even had the little tree logo in their, in their uh, Conservative Party policy. And David Cameron rode a bike to work. Well now, a lot of people think the Tories were absolute rotters for pretending to be so nice and kind. They say the streets are full of people, sleeping rough again, and the hospitals are falling to pieces again, just like under Mrs Thatcher. So to recap, there's Labour, which isn't old Labour because that was socialist and nationalised things and had free education. But the Labour Party isn't new Labour either because that gave our money to the banks and had expensive wars, which we lost. So Labour isn't like that anymore. They are newish Labour. Nobody's absolutely clear about what they stand for, except they said they want to support hard-working families. They're also promising to freeze energy prices, create lots of jo jobs, and protect the NHS. And they will reduce tuition fees to £6,000 a year, which is big of them, as it was £3,000 when they were last in power. In fact, it was free when they first came to power. Then there are the Tories, who don't represent the aristocracy anymore, but have quite posh leaders who don't like taxes on the rich. They also want to support hard-working families. David Cameron's talked about building a stronger, more competitive economy and securing a better future for Britain. That's because our economy is not doing as badly as other European countries. If you think austerity has been bad here, you should go to Greece. They're going to keep building a competitive economy, lower taxes and keep our military strong. At the last election, the Tories promised to reduce the UK's debt. But we haven't reduced our debt, which is around one 0.4 trillion pounds, and that's increased from 1 trillion pounds in 2010. So, you could vote for Lib Dems, who also want to work, help hard-working families. On their website they say, we champion the freedom, dignity and well-being of individuals. We acknowledge and respect their right to freedom of conscience. It's hard to disagree with that. They say we're going to build houses, protect our civil rights and make Britain fairer. Now, there are also other parties that people used to ignore, but more people will vote for this time. The UKIP that David Cameron said was full of swivel-eyed loons. At the last election, their leader, late Nigel Farage, was in a plane that crashed and they didn't get any MPs, not one. But, in the EU elections last year, they got more MEPs than Labour or the Conservatives. Now, that's quite ironic, because they've got more MPs to the Parliament they want to abolish, but at the same time, they've got none at that time in the Parliament they want us to support. So people started to pay much more attention to UKIP, which is why you hear so much about them, and immigration in the media now. UKIP hate the EU and immigration. So they stand for hard-working English families, but probably not hard-working Polish families. If we vote for them in England, we'll be something like Trump. Everyone will have to learn to speak English, and it'll be much harder for you to go to get a job in Germany or live in Spain if you fancy that. And you won't be allowed to eat pizza. No, that's not true. Actually, you will be allowed to eat pizza. But they will make us leave the EU, cut taxes for everyone, including the wealthiest, and make it easier to do common sense degrees like science and maths, and make it harder for people doing made up degrees like media studies. So, if you're in the Faculty of Media and Communications, you're in big trouble. UKIP's manifesto is based on common sense policies built on freedom, independence.
Church, Democracy, and it's hard to disagree with that. They have two MPs, Douglas Cardswell and Mark Breckless, both former Conservative MPs. More Conservatives might defect to UKIP if they carry on doing well in the elections. But the Conservatives hope to stop going on about the EU by holding a referendum. So, if the Tories win, you'll get a vote on the EU in 2017, whether to stay in the EU or not. And then there's the Green Party, who want more people to have solar panels, ride bicycles in proper safe bike lanes, and be able to buy cannabis legally, like in Holland. <laughs> They will also get rid of Britain's nuclear weapons, make higher education free, and build half a million homes. However, their leader, Natalie Bennett, was very, very vague about how they would fund this in an awful radio interview on LBC lately. And then, there's the SNP. You can't vote for SNP in England because they are a Scottish Nationalist Party and they don't want to be part of the UK anymore. We would have to redesign the Union Jack if, they got in, if, they got, if Scotland got independence, and they nearly did in a vote last year. David Cameron, Nick Clegg and Edmund Van got so scared that people were going to vote for independence that they all went and campaigned together in Scotland where they hardly ever go. They even signed a pledge together to give Scotland extra powers if they didn't vote for independence. But people remembered the pledge, mm, Nick Clegg. So they called it a vow rather than a pledge. The Scots eventually voted against independence by 55% to 45%, which was still pretty close. But the SNP is more popular than ever now in Scotland, and they're not going to go away. In 2010, SNP returned just six MPs to Westminster. The latest opinion polls show that SNP could get 56 of the 59 Scottish seats. So if that poll is right, all the other parties, the Tories, the Liberals and Labour, will be able to share a cab back to Westminster and the SNP will hold the balance of power. In our Parliament, no one party could form a government so it will be another coalition or confidence and supply deal. That means we muddle along for another five years and the SNP will be able to upset the apple cart in Westminster, which is something they're really looking forward to doing. Their leader, Nicola Sturgeon, has said she might prop up a Labour minority government in return for three things. More power to the Scottish Parliament, an end to austerity, and a decision not to renew UK's nuclear weapon system, Trident, which is based in Scotland. And the SNP is supported by Clyde Cymru, the party of Wales, led by Leanne Wood, who spoke very slowly in the TV <laughs> debates since she was in a nursery school teacher. And she told Nigel Farage off really well for being naughty and rude about foreign people with HIV, and she got a huge round of applause from the audience. So the Greens, Pai Cameroon and SNP are led by women who are anti-austerity and very anti-UKIP, which is why they hugged at the end of the last TV debate that David Cameron hid from. They hugged and shook hands but refused to shake hands with Nigel Farage, who is a very silly boy. <laughs> a coalition of Labour and these three ladies would be considered a good thing with left-wing people, with people with left-wing views, but not the people on the right. It's a bit like, like old Labour, SNP, same as old Labour, old Labour propping up newish Labour, which would make old ex-Labour voters really happy, but new Labour and most other people would be mad as hell. So, you'll be able to see for yourself what the party stand for in the two TV debates. The first one had seven candidates and looked like a bus queue. The second one had five, so we've gone from elections that looked like boxing matches from the past with two candidates, to elections that looked like team tag wrestling or seven-a-side football. So who's going to win? No one party probably, but some sort of coalition from this lot. It's probably going to be either Conservative, Liberal Coalition, or a Labour Liberal Coalition with some SNP support from time to time. The real thing is, nobody knows. Not even, for once, the polling organisations. So, I've run out of time now, and I haven't really been able to tell you much about the party's policies, but you can find that out if you go to their websites. They've been all launched now as manifestos, so just go and look online and read them for yourself.
You can, won't really ban eating pizza, but you should look carefully at what they and the other parties promise to do in their manifestos before deciding how to vote. If you want a quick look at the BBC, if you want a quick look, the BBC has an overlook on just one page called Manifesto Watch, and it's very good. If you can't be bothered with that, try one of the quick quiz websites like VoteForPolicies.org. That's like a personality test you get in the magazines, and it's really easy. There's also a question time debate here at the university next Monday, the 27th, from 7.30 till 9, with parliamentary prospective candidates from all the major parties who will be answering the audience's questions. So, if you can't summon the energy to do any of those things, then don't be surprised if the next government does something you don't like. This is your only chance to stop them on May the 7th. And the next chance might not be until 2020. Thank you.